Bob Shapiro did everything in this world to try and get a plea bargain going before Johnny Cochran got in the case, because the only way he was going to stay in control. To the point where one day I'm in the courtroom with Bob Kardashian, and he's worked out a deal to plead O.J. and send Kardashian to jail. Hello, my name is Dave Emery, and in this half-hour segment, you're going to hear a conference called Interview, recorded on October 13, 1996, with three different authors. First of all, you'll be hearing Donald Freed, who, along with Raymond Briggs, is the co-author of a book called Killing Time, published in hardcover by Macmillan. And also, you will be hearing from Stephen Singular, who is the author of a book called Legacy of Deception, published in softcover by Dove Books, copyrighted 1995. And also Stephen Worth, who, along with Carl Jaspers, authored the book Blood Oath, uh, subtitled The Conspiracy to Murder Nicole Brown Simpson. That book was published in softcover by Rainbow Books and copyright 1996. All three of these authors have developed information indicating that O.J. Simpson did not commit the killings that most people believe that he committed. But in fact, uh, the case has been misrepresented by the media and mishandled by the authorities. Among the many tantalizing details that you'll hear in uh, the upcoming uh, two half-hour segments concerns the fact that the grand jury would not indict O.J. Simpson. They did not vote to indict O.J. Simpson, something the media has not brought us. This interview is one of several interviews that I will be having with these authors. And again, uh, there will be a free flow of discussion. I have a few things that I interject during the course of this particular interview. But by and large, it is these three authors uh, sharing information with themselves. This program was recorded at my home base station, KFJC-FM in Los Altos Hills, on the evening of October 13, 1996. Veteran listeners to this program will also eventually be hearing interviews with these three authors. I recorded two interviews, each consisting of two half-hour segments, on November 24th of 1996 as well. Those of you who have been listening for a long time know that I used to produce a long series of programs. These interviews are not intended as a series and do not comprise a series. Rather, they are separate, standalone interviews that will, however, provide an incremental understanding of the O.J. Simpson case. However, they are meant to be aired alone. We're going to proceed now with the first side of this interview. Again, this is Donald Freed, Stephen Worth, and Stephen Singular, recorded on October 13, 1996. Uh, I wonder if you could comment on the, the treatment of the media in this case and also the treatment that uh, each of you three have had, uh, or, or in some cases, as is the case with Stevens, Worth, and Singular, the non-treatment. Well, I'd like to start by um, saying Donald Freed has done a great job. I've been watching him on television for the past couple of weeks. I have only seen a couple of performances, but uh, he really uh, stood in the fire with Fred Goldman whenever that was a couple of weeks ago, and that's really the first time that I've ever seen anybody challenge Fred Goldman's assumptions about this case. Somebody needed to do it. Donald did it. He kept his cool. He did it in a very good way. And then uh, on the uh, other program with Charles Grodin, in which for the first time you had two authors sitting there trying to present some actual evidence to people other than a lot of opinion and gossip, uh, Donald again had the temerity to take on Joseph DeGeneva, who for two years has basically run his mouth about this case without anything really substantial to back it up. Stephen, who I is thought Steve? it was an admirable performance, and I send him my kudos. Who is, who is Mr. De, De, De Geneva? I'm he's not... one of the regulars on the Geraldo Rivera show. He's, I think he's connected to Victoria Tensing, who's another regular. In fact, I think they're married. I could be wrong about that. They, they, they are, and they're former uh, government prosecutors, right. well-known Republican activists who have found a, a birth um, on the Geraldo and, and Grodin. Let me greet uh, my colleagues tonight, and let me ask them. They are uh, respectively uh, have done the definitive work, especially on uh, uh, Mark Furman. And with that uh, plea bargain coming uh, in just a few days ago, uh, I think it would be extremely um, interesting to hear uh, both of them talk about the meaning of that plea bargain. Okay, gentlemen. Well, it's an interesting thing. I was just watching Boyosi today. I don't know whether it was a repeat or it was live with Grodin. But they're like forgiving this guy. Like he did nothing. 
And I think the, the, the N-word was the tip of the iceberg. People forgetting this fellow's beliefs. The fact that, I mean, at least we uncovered, uh, unless somebody uh, can um, refute it, that when he said he was at uh, La Quinta, California, on that day at 8 o'clock, he wasn't. Uh, can, you, uh, can you explain, Stephen, uh, the significance of that uh, in the context of the O.J. Simpson case for the audience? Sure, and Marshall Clark was, um, uh, when, he, when he first got on, Marshall Clark was asking him, where was he on 8 o'clock on uh, June 12th? And he very calmly said he was at La Quinta, California, attending a, a police league. Um, I think he was a delegate there. And he had left just prior to uh, a barbecue. And then he drove, which is about two and a half hours to his house, got home and went to sleep, and then was awoken to go to the scene. The problem is there was no barbecue on Saturday night. I should say on Sunday night. It was on Saturday night. Now, why there was... Uh, established this, uh, this um, time sequencing is beyond me. But what seems to have come out, uh, uh, Joe Bosco writes about, uh, you know, a, a time, I think, uh, the, the other night, uh, Stephen Singler talked about this phone call at around 2.53, was that right, Stephen? That's correct. Uh, from the um, uh, Rockingham area. In Darden's book, unless he's made a giant uh, era, uh, he said that Vanatta and Lang were there at 2.20 in the morning. Now, everybody kept saying that um, Furman couldn't have done anything because he, you know, he, there were 17 officers around. Well, apparently, maybe he got there a lot earlier, and so did those other detectives, because for some reason, nobody kept notes except Furman, which is kind of strange. Right. It, with all due respect, you know, to Diane Sawyer, and I guess it's ABC Television, and she was the one who interviewed Furman, I believe it was, last Tuesday on national television. The I think by focusing solely or exclusively or particularly on race, you play into the hands of Mark Furman, and that's basically what was done on that television show, which I again feel that he controlled very subtly for his own ends. It's very easy for him to stand up and make an apology and say it's from the bottom of his heart and beat his breast a few times and go to a commercial. If someone had been interviewing him who was familiar with the evidence and who have, could have walked him through his preliminary hearing testimony step by step and what he said at that time in his own words and then proceeded from there to other aspects of evidence, you could have gotten beyond the race issue for the first time. Talking exclusively about race only serves his purposes because exactly. it takes it off of the evidence, and it's the evidence in this case that will open the door to the other aspects of it. One of the aspects of this case that I've noted for my audience ever since the murders occurred and the investigation, or perhaps alleged investigation, began was that this case in its external circumstances, or what we were told by the prosecution and sadly the media, which uh, have been almost coterminous in this case, uh, this corresponds to a T to the most pejorative and oldest racist stereotype in this country's history, that of the hyper-libidinous, hyper-aggressive black male lusting after, possessing, and destroying the white female. And uh, sadly, this uh, archetype, this racist archetype, has been uh, dominant so far in the dialogue. Well, that's well put. It's superimposed over a chaotic crime scene that was as uh, hosed down and destroyed, except as you had, except from the back gate, apparently. I'd like to uh, uh, say to Steve, uh, singular, uh, and to others who are listening in this first generation now of analysis of this uh, uh, great murder mystery, is that uh, the Joe Bosco book, A Problem of Evidence, uh, gives a dramatic confirmation uh, to one of the centerpieces of Legacy of Deception and using uh, separate sources. Uh, obviously, I think that's a fair statement to say. Uh, isn't it, Steve? Uh, separate yeah. sources arriving at the strong indication that Furman left the Bundy murder scene uh, early in the morning hours uh, before 3 o'clock 
and went to the Rockingham estate and may have there, and I believe this may be new, and tell me if I'm right, Steve, planted the glove first in the Bronco, only to move it later to behind Kalen's guest house. Am I right so far? That is not something I'm... My understanding is that it got inside the Bronco, but I could not say when. And That and, would be total. That would be new, what you're saying. And were you... Were you um, it, it, it was a... I, did you find it interesting? And Stephen Worth, did you have you had a chance to read Joe Bosco's book? Yes, I've written, I, I've, I've, written, I've read his uh, book and uh, was um, quite pleased with the information he came out with. I've done some analysis of a photo that was in Darden's book. As a matter of fact, provided it to the defense. In fact, they've now found some new prints from the photo I blew up. But what was most interesting. Uh, of that photo is there seems to have been two photo shots taken, like, you know, the uh, whole photo scene with Mark Furman pointing at the glove. Yes. Except they moved the glove. All right. Uh, but they, and along with that, moved the envelope. The envelope has footprints on it. Yes. Which never appeared, at least for the FBI. But not only that, when they moved the envelope, they moved the leaves along with it which meant there was a, uh, they intended to, um, I would say, defraud uh, the people. I mean, what they did was uh, they, they moved it so that people wouldn't realize that the envelope had been moved. Very, very strange. Uh, and the fact that there is um, Nicole's blood on the bottom of Ron Goldman's sneaker, along with his own, means he had a step in, Nicole's blood, which eliminates what Marsha Clark was talking about. So, uh, a thesis of, or theory of um, uh, Nicole being first knocked out, then splitting the throat of um, uh, Goldman, then coming back uh, to uh, Nicole. I see. It, uh, it, it just doesn't fly. Now, uh, Stephen Worth, where, this is information that's new to me. Uh, where does your uh, information come from? Okay, well, the information comes from. A diligent reading of the um, the, uh, the depositions and the transcripts. It's it's the most confusing set of information I've ever seen. The um, the boots are evidence item 78, and what they gave the implication was they took a drop of blood off of the boot, but it wasn't a drop. They what they uh, actually says they scraped one little drop off the bottom. But they also said they took a mixture of Nicole Brown Simpson's blood and Ron Goldman's off the sides, you know, the edges. So that no longer is just something off a knife. He had a step in it. But there are also footprints that don't, that don't seem to appear on any photos. Something else that I have noticed, I haven't seen or found anywhere in the transcripts where they show footprints and blood prints or the blood spots, uh, so that they're definitively to the left of the shoe prints. I haven't seen that anywhere. I think they all saw a footprint and then a blood print, like 112, 113, 114, 115, and then uh, these footprints, but nothing ever showing them in one picture. That's very interesting, extremely interesting. Uh, you know this civil trial... Uh, will depend on the forensics uh, to a much greater degree. And so uh, the work that you've done uh, may enter in. I know that their uh, defense is aware of the March 9, 1995 examination that's in Stephen Worth's book, wherein Furman misrepresents and lies about his uh, whereabouts on the day and the night uh, of the murder. And uh, then with Joe Bosco's book, uh, confirming, giving a second source to the most sensational assertion ever made in the case, which first appeared in um, uh, Legacy of Deception. This is a remarkable uh, development if we had normal news. Of course, we don't. But nonetheless, the record is kept. The accounting is being kept. But I'd like to ask both gentlemen to comment on what I think is the journalistic coup uh, of the case, and that is the revelation by Joe Bosco that the white, basically white, wealthy grand jury of Los Angeles was not going to indict O.J. Simpson. This, uh, I, this is new to me, and uh, I'm astounded, uh, again, if the two Stevens could comment on that. 
Well, I mean, I, I, I think uh, it, it's what they did is any intelligent person looking at the, the so-called evidence would have gone the same way. I mean, there's no mountain of evidence when you when you get those police officers getting up there, changing their line, and they can't remember what they did before. You know, 15 minutes before they can't remember, and they they didn't take any notes. Well, the smarter the uh, or the higher the IQ, let's say, of of the uh, of individuals, the, and the higher the reasoning ability, the quicker they catch on. And it took, I guess. Uh, only a, a day or so for them to say they were not going to indict. Not on first well, I mean, murder. In, in terms of basic forensic evidence, you know, you have no murder weapon, no witnesses, no, uh, I guess, fingerprints, shoe prints that were any match to Simpson at all. And the other thing is, is that uh, when did the blood appear in the Bronco? I mean, what what was the grand jury told? You know, some of that blood was turned up in August. That's so right. you may. <laughs> You may have had a few blood drops on the ground over at Bundy that had not been uh, DNA tested. You didn't have much evidence to go on. And, and as Donald Fried and I have talked about in the past, you know, it was not just the grand jury. It was people inside Garcetti's office, in particular one Peter Bazanich who worked right under Garcetti who came to him and said the same thing. Yeah. You, you need more evidence before you go ahead and... Uh, try to indict O.J. Simpson and try, to br try and bring him to trial. So, it, it, and, and Mr. Bozanich, as many of us now know, was pr promptly gotten out of the office and demoted to Compton, uh, uh, another neighborhood in Los Angeles. Uh, so there were grumblings on all sides. That one of the things that Bosco talked about on television that I'd certainly never heard and I was fascinated by was that he said uh, Marcia Clark was known within the district attorney's office as the person you called when you had a problem with evidence, which, of course, is the name of his book, A Problem of Evidence. What, what, what does he mean by that, Stephen? He meant that uh, when you've got a problem, uh, you, there were probably a, a numerous district attorneys or assistant DAs or deputy DAs that you might get a hold of, but that she was the one whose number you reached for first, meaning that it would, uh, I'm extrapolating here, let's be clear about it, but the clear understanding I had was that it would no longer be a problem. That's right. And that Phil Van Adder That's promptly right. called her and said, and this I believe is the morning of June 13th, Marsha, we've got a problem with evidence. And what he meant, now, I don't know beyond that, but that's a pretty stunning revelation right there. Donald, uh, uh, when you were on with Joe Bosco, when you were in Chicago and, um, on the Groden Show, at the end of the show, did Joe Bosco not say that uh, Mark Furman had been with Nicole Brown Simpson in Aston, Colorado? Did yes, he? he did. He did say that. He did? I believe that he did, yeah. You see, I was in Chicago in a broom closet. Right. right. So please right. tell me what I missed. You know, well, I tried to get in touch with Joe Bosco to his publicist because I could swear. And I was just at the end, and of course, nobody said anything. I have not heard a word about it since. Yeah. This, see, one of the things that is in the book I wrote, and I admit that it really doesn't go anywhere, but I was told early on there was an Aspen connection to the, the crime, and I sort of put that in, and, and I again acknowledge I, I wish I could have done more with it. What I was always interested in was getting a hold of phone records, because without subpoena power, that's a fairly hard thing to do. I suggested it to the defense numerous times to Carl Douglas, and as far as I know, it was never done. I think phone records would have helped establish a lot more about that relationship, and some of them may have connected into Aspen. Well, you know, I spoke to McKenna, and I said, had they ever gotten a hold of Nicole Brown Simpson's uh, cell phone? Hmm. She got cell phone, even if you call locally, mm -hmm. would have... Um, you know, something would have come up. And, you know, with all of the talk of uh, Mark Furman supposedly being Nicole's private cop, is it possible that, that she had spoken to him about watching out for her? Uh, uh, Stephen Wolf, who is McKenna? McKenna is the private investigator, along with Pavlik. Right. Uh, that defense. works for the defense team. Okay. And in He's particular, in, uh, West Palm Beach. Associated with F. Lee Bailey. Quite yes. Yeah. Uh, David, um, a little further on this grand jury. Yes. Um, 
This was a runaway grand jury, uh, unheard of in modern Los Angeles. The grand jury that would normally indict a ham sandwich, as the joke goes. They were deadlocked 11 to 11. Uh, they did, they would not indict, uh, any more than the mock juries or the, uh, focus groups before whom, uh, the evidence was placed. So that no group, uh, ever submitted this case has ever voted uh, a guilty or an indictment or to bind O.J. Simpson over. And so to persist in saying that it's race that voted not guilty rather than a lack of evidence is a, uh, a no uh, completely exploded by Bosco's uh, um, a bombshell, and remember that his source is Peter Bosanich, a director in the district attorney's office at the highest echelon. Right. One of the things that uh, you discuss in your book, Don, and is uh, also brought up by Stephen Singular in his book, Legacy of Deception. Uh, by the way, we should mention, perhaps for the audience, that Stephen Singular's book, although sadly underpublicized by Dove Publishing, has at least had sort of a, a secondary life by being actually written about in some of the other books that have come out of the case, because right. uh, your, your book proposal, Stephen, was actually a part of the investigation. And, yeah. and the defense. Well, I, yeah, I mean, the, 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 his, the whole history of the book proposal, which, which I don't even pretend to know, I think if we knew more about it, I think it would shed light on this whole case. I really believe it played some role in the prosecution bringing in the FBI to test for EDTA because they knew that's what the defense was up to. They made a big thing about it in front of Judge Ito, said we're going to run these tests, we're going to get the definitive results, we're going to prove there's no preservative in that blood, we're going to determine once and for all it was never planted. They ran their tests, they did their due diligence, and they never called their witnesses. One of the things that Donald Freed alluded to earlier, was the, and, and that you uh, have written about, Stephen Singular, was the rapid breaking down of the crime scene. Everything was hosed down the day afterward, with the exception of the back gate, in which a blood sample was lifted weeks later, and what uh, perhaps we could nickname in the terms of the in terms of the O.J. Simpson investigation, the back gate gate. Right. I mean, it, just just a cursory glance at the uh, crime scene would would lead you to believe there was a lot of blood to pick up and test there. And you know, I mean, we, we all those of us who followed the case closely know that there was great dispute about blood that didn't match any of the three principles, and well, the defense know, spent a lot of time trying to get that in. This photo I blew up, which I sent to Blazin. What's that? It has. First off, the glove, which is evidence item 37, mm -hmm. never went out for DNA testing. It was type O. They didn't get a subtype on it, which means 45% 40, of the United States could have, uh, you know, uh, left the blood on that. Now, this is the blood on, a, on the glove that was found the at, glove. Bundy, uh, at but, Bundy. But miraculously, there's no blood on the hat, which is sitting right next to it underneath plants that are covered with blood. Now, now type O, OJ is what type? Oh, he's A B, I think. So this was not OJ's. Was it? Could it have been Nicole's it or Ron's? Couldn't, no. So it's the the only one who it could have been would have been Ron Goldman. But they, you would think, to for exculpatory reasons, they would have done a total test. But not only that, the entire area around the glove has got blood drops the size of about a quarter. No. And they never tested any of those blood drops either. Is or that right? They claim there's the part. In fact, I think Bosco talks about. Some of the blood drops, maybe they just they tested it and never um, mm -hmm. gave the information out. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, uh, back to uh, just uh, a second to the whole question of EDTA and what I've termed uh, back gate gate under the circumstances. It uh, is not only strange that the, the crime scene was washed out and yet this blood sample was lifted weeks later, but one of the things that uh, your investigation, Stephen Singular, uh, brought to the attention of, or at least attempted to bring to the attention of, of uh, defense and prosecution, was the whole question of EDTA. Could you develop that? Well, I just um, went there early on in early August of 94, and I said, you know, we can all argue about this case, but it's come to my attention that if you will simply take the blood that is O.J. Simpson's, identified as O.J. Simpson's blood, and if you will test it for a preservative, you will get a definitive answer about whether this came out of his body on the night of the crimes or whether it came out of a test tube, which has a preservative or more particularly an anticoagulant in it, called EDTA. I did a lot of research into EDTA. I put the defense 
onto that and hooked them up with some people who were much more knowledgeable about it than I was, so they had the scientific background. And I really believe, I believe to this day, that the great um, hole in this whole situation is that we do not, we were never able to get a definitive answer on all of that blood. On the particular cases of the, of the case of the socks in the bedroom, virtually everyone has now conceded that there was EDTA in that blood on those socks. So that's, that's that. What I wanted to get to was the, were the five blood drops at the, Bundy, at the Bundy crime scene. That, to me, is the core evidence that would have convicted Simpson or acquitted him. So go ahead. Develop if, that. If that's his blood and it came out of his body, that would be very hard to explain. If that's his blood that was sent off to Cellmark and there's EDTA in it, <laughs> I think the case is blown. I mean, there is no case. That's, that's the critical evidence in this case. That concludes this particular side. You've been listening to an interview with Stephen Wirth, the co-author along with Carl Jaspers, of Blood Oath, subtitled The Conspiracy to Murder Nicole Brown Simpson, published in soft cover by Rainbow Books, copyright 1996. Another of the speakers has been Stephen Singular, who is the author of Legacy of Deception, published in soft cover by Dove Books, copyright 1995, and Donald Freed, along with Raymond Briggs, the co-author of Killing Time, published in hardcover by Macmillan and copyrighted 1995. This interview was recorded on October 13, 1996. There will be a continuation of this interview in the next half-hour segment. My name is Dave Emery. Thanks for listening. Hello, my name is Dave Emery, and in this half-hour segment, we're going to continue with a conference called Interview recorded on October 13, 1996, between, first of all, Stephen Wirth, the co-author along with Carl Jaspers of Blood Oath, subtitled A Conspiracy to Murder Nicole Brown Simpson, also Stephen Singular, the author of Legacy of Deception, published in softcover by Dove Books, copyright 1995. By the way, uh, Blood Oath was published in softcover by Rainbow Books and copyright 1996. Also, Donald Freed, along with Raymond Briggs, the co-author of Killing Time, published in hardcover by Macmillan, copyright 1996. All three authors have developed very compelling information that O.J. Simpson, in fact, was framed and did not kill the uh, people, did not commit the murders that he is commonly supposed to uh, have committed, despite the fact that uh, the grand jury, the L.A. County grand jury, would not indict O.J. Simpson, and despite the fact that a criminal jury in the criminal case acquitted O.J. Simpson. We're going to pick up the interview where we left off in our previous half-hour segment. So this is the interview with the Stevens Singular and Worth and Donald Freed. One of the things you point out, uh, Donald Freed, is that some of the blood drops supposedly from O.J. Simpson do have EDTA and some of them do not. Now, Stephen Worth, in your book, Blood Oath, uh, your anonymous informant, codenamed Skinner, maintains that uh, part of this cause, white supremacist organization and strike team, that according to your informant performed the crimes, uh, basically had at their disposal a blood and DNA specialist who had obtained a sample of O.J. Simpson's blood from Cedars sinai Hospital, where he had gone for surgery, and you theorize about the possibility that uh, that individual may have been uh, Stephen Colburn, an acquaintance of uh, Timothy McVeigh. We should note that Colburn has not been charged with any crime. No, Colburn went to jail for possession of a gun, was picked up in uh, the McVeigh, uh, uh, Timothy McVeigh, Oklahoma bombing investigation. He was a DNA specialist there. Uh, with, it, it just, you know, coincidental, he happened to be a DNA specialist at the same place uh, that he possibly would have access to the blood. But there's other sources for that type of, for the type of testing they did. There's Arnell who went to the hospital very frequently, and Jason. Uh, uh, they could get any of their blood. See, there's a lot of strange things that occurred. There was a phone call that Donald Freed talked about in his book, that Joe Bosco talked about, the phone call of some woman calling before the murders were discovered. Yeah, we, we, we right. mentioned that briefly. Okay, now somebody had to know that there were murders occurring. Mm -hmm. right, that's number one. you got a watch stopped at a 10.03. For some reason, never used in evidence. Now, you know, barking dogs, squealing dogs, uh, hopping dog I don't care what you want to use. I mean, uh, 
you would sooner rely on a crystal or a watch stop. Now, Donald Free talks about it in his book, uh, and it's, uh, it's thought, it was talked about in some newspaper articles that never used. Now, the only assumption that can be made is somebody purposely stopped the watch at 10.03, not realizing it gives O.J. an alibi because he's making two cell phone calls to Bobby Harry <laughs> at 10.01, 10.02. You can't be killing people and, you know, at the same time. So, you know, you, you got that. You've got um, uh, this, these thumps on the wall. Nobody, but nobody has explained the thumps on the wall. Without those thumps, there is no way that Mark Furman ever goes around to the back of the house. Right. I mean, they can make any kind of excuse. No, but now, if people say, well, the thumps didn't occur, he's got, um, Cato Kalen's got a witness to that. He's. I shouldn't say he told his girlfriend uh, on the phone that night about the thumps. So the thumps had to have occurred unless the two of them were in. And then what you know what what rational rational reason would they have to you know um, come up with those thumps? So you've got somebody pre-planning. It's the only way that makes any sense. Someone pre-planning this. Now there's also a blue jacket a denim jacket that Risky talks about in his testimony that's inside Nicole Brown Simpson's house. Now, who, who is Lipsky? Uh, Risky was the Lipsky? Uh, first police officer um, that came to the scene. He was the one, uh, he testified about keeping the same... Go, the, the go same, ahead with this. Excuse me? Go ahead, this is interesting. Yeah, uh, keeping the, the scene pristine and... He talks about a blue jacket, and they were wondering, did that belong to Ron Goldman or Nicole? Now, if that belonged to Ron Goldman, the whole case changes. They never talk about it. The defense never brings it up. It kind of just flops right there. Now, you know, the, nobody, you know, what's even, even stranger, none of the fingerprints that you would have expected, including the fingerprints that Joe Bosco talked about, that Dr. Lee said were on the... He saw on the eyeglasses. I remember Dr. Lee couldn't do anything. They could only examine. They could not do anything to that envelope case with the, the eyeglasses. He said he saw a partial fingerprint that never was one of the 17 fingerprints that Aguilar right. talked about when he testified. Nor did they he, uh, testify, testify about the fingerprint found on the back gate that Furman talked about. Uh, what's something I wanted to ask you about, Donald, and uh, I've been an admirer of your work for quite some time, uh, and that concerns, uh, and, and this might seem a little weird or sort of a leap uh, in terms of the O.J. Simpson case. Uh, in your book, Death in Washington, that you co-authored with Fred Landis, uh, it's a book about the assassination of Orlando Letelier in Washington, D.C. It's also about the destabilization of the Allende regime in Chile by our intelligence system. Uh, you specifically discuss Operation Centaur, the destabilization of the Allende regime. And one of the things that you talk about in the book is the psychological warfare and media component to that destabilization. And uh, you and your co-author Fred Landis uh, discuss, describe the subjective reaction of someone who had been in Chile during this destabilization as uh, almost producing a sickening kind of feeling. Could, could you tell us uh, uh, briefly about, uh, the, about Operation Centaur, the media and psychological warfare aspects of that, and also something called the quartered man, one of the central features in that program, in that destabilization program and psychological warfare program, was something called the, the decalcidado, or the quartered man. Yes, you know, that's a shrewd observation. Um, when you talk about uh, psychological warfare, as an extension of armed violence of foreign policy, such as in Chile, uh, Indonesia, Guatemala, and elsewhere uh, over the past period. Um, you're talking about uh, manipulation of the media in a certain way that goes beyond propaganda. Propaganda is simply slanting information and planting stories. But when you take the next step, then you are into the realm of the non-rational. 
And that is the realm of monsters, of El Descuatizado, the quartered man, of the various... Of in in uh, Indonesia, it was the uh, the alligator uh, with the uh, with the open jaws. Um, communism was equated during the Cold War with a series of nightmarish images which struck at the psychosexual roots of identity. And uh, the aim was not to create anti-communism. Anti-communism was the aim of propaganda. The aim of psychological warfare was to create madness and bloodshed. And who was the, what was the quartered man? Well, the quartered man was uh, uh, someone was found murdered, but it was then turned into a monster by the press uh, that was seen all over the country like a Frankenstein monster. And so people thought they were buying human flesh at the market and so forth. Little by little, the country was driven into a nervous breakdown. Now, uh, in this case of the Simpson case, what you have are the preconditions. When you have Time magazine uh, demonizing a photograph, when you have the New York Times uh, whitewashing an absolute fascist uh, such as Mark Foreman, when you have ABC, you have the components. You don't. I'm not suggesting now that you have uh, the mighty Wurlitzer of the CIA working coordinating uh, a hydra-headed octopi. Uh, of uh, uh, psychological warfare. By the way, the, the, the uh, mighty Wurlitzer is a term applied by former Deputy Director of Central <laughs> Intelligence Frank Wisner to the CIA's yes, yes. media component. Go ahead. Yes, yes, you have the frame of reference, all right, David. But what you have are the components here, and when the Washington Post puts out a boilerplate story that says, in effect, uh, conspiracy theory of cocaine uh, in... Uh, what well, they set up with the story of about the co CIA cocaine uh, story of Los Angeles, but then on the jump sheet and from then on, the word conspiracy appears again and again and again. Conspiracy being the C word that communism used to be. Uh, you have the precondition here, and you've always had it, uh, for what happens under fascism, uh, where you move from rational propaganda over to the non-rational. That's what's to watch for. That's, uh, uh, everything short of that is still propaganda. Uh, when it moves beyond that into the non-rational, then you are in a different situation. But I would like to say that to those who follow uh, the content analysis of the media, and certainly those who follow David Emery, who always has this dimension to the stories, because that's the... Uh, without that, that's the mirror we have to hold up to reality. Um, the Darden book, the Bosco book, both in their way now, are from separate sources, confirming the Stephen Singular book, um, so that you now have a way to deal with the blood uh, evidence. There is a process here we're talking about, and if you put that on one side and the timeline on the other side, you begin to have a dialectic to deal with this, and now you can confront the racism directly. Uh, it just takes a lot of courage, a lot of stamina, but luckily, all three of you have it, even though I am leaving. Because I, uh, 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 Donald, uh, what, the one, uh, one point I wanted to uh, put uh, before you, before we uh, bid you a fond farewell here, uh, and that is, the, the I, again, in reading uh, Death in Washington and about uh, the quartered man and about the uh, psychological warfare program in Chile in which the public was obsessed with these images of mutilation, and uh, this in turn was used to imply that society was unstable. They needed a change. They needed a, a strong man to put a yes. halt to all of this uncontrolled, violent, yes. sickening chaos. Yes. Uh, and the subjective accounts of people who had experienced this, they said they were almost physically sickened. It reminded me of at least my own reaction to the... the media blitzkrieg, and I use that term advisedly, vis-a-vis -vis the O.J. Simpson case, I wonder, I wonder uh, and again, if you think I'm full of beans, don't, uh, don't hesitate to tell me, but I wonder to the extent to which uh, we might uh, consider the murder of Nicole and consider her perhaps under the circumstances the quartered woman, la decazidata. Well, you know, after all, in Stephen Worth's book, um, it's... Its great credibility is that Mr. Worth introduces uh, his own critical reasoning into it. He tells the reader how far he can vouch 
for any given thing. He does his own independent research, which is flawless, in terms of the neo-fascist movements in this country and their recent history, which, interestingly enough, hooks up with the uh, now, I think, famous book of Stephen Singular's about the murder of Mr. Berg. So you, you, you have that, and you do know that uh, from the ancillary material of the Turner Diaries and others, there is a great appetite and a long-shared kind of uh, underground vision in this country of how apocalyptic events will come about. And whether a given event, such as the Simpson case, is, fits primarily or secondarily into that, that's the kind of thing that can only be answered when you've had a full and real investigation uh, into these matters. But all of you will probably be interested to know that as of last week in Los Angeles, the anti-terrorism uh, unit of the LAPD, so long disgraced, the notorious unit, has now been uh, refashioned and re-empowered. And this is a, a unit that uh, had been conducting political espionage mm -hmm. in the early 1980s uh, on behalf of a right-wing intelligence exactly. outfit called Western Goals. Well, exactly. There you have it. David has done the most... Uh, uh, extensive uh, documentation of the use of computers uh, to disseminate a list of uh, uh, individuals who were targeted for elimination. Uh, by the way, the in one of the interesting things about the Western Goals investigation, which again, uh, members of the LAPD uh, counter-terrorist squad, were conducting political espionage on behalf of a right-wing intelligence outfit, uh, and then putting it into computers, and some of the information was being put into a matching computer bank in Germany. Well, that is exactly right, and some of the people involved in the predecessor to this counterterrorism unit, which was known as the um, the uh, Criminal Conspiracy Section, CCS, and the Public Disorder Intelligence uh, Division, PDID, some of these officers are now high-ranking in the LAPD, and they, one of them, was in charge of the crime scene at Bundy. Uh, one of the things you mentioned too in your book. Uh De in death in Washington. In your book, uh, Killing Time, Donald, is that uh, right after the uh, murders of Ron and Nicole, uh, the LAPD engaged in an investigation of possible uh, Confederates of O.J. Simpson. Uh, their houses were staked out, bugged, surveilled, etc., and that some of the people involved in this surveillance were people who'd been involved in the COINTELPRO program in the L.A. area against yes. the Black Panthers and others. But that is exactly right, and as uh, uh Stephen Worth said, and Stephen Singular, uh, this plea bargain was not the tip of the iceberg. It was the tip of the wrong iceberg. And, uh, and now your discussion flows naturally from Furman uh, back into the uh, situation in Los Angeles and what it is they were turning away from and why it is when they turned away from something, all they could see was the shadow of O.J. Simpson. Had I not made an earlier plan, I would have stayed with you but you're all in good hands. I'll be talking to you all soon. And I thank you, and I thank the listeners. All good right. luck, Donald. Donald, uh, thanks so much for participating. That concludes this interview. We have been visiting with Stephen Wirth, along with Carl Jaspers, the co-author of Blood Oath, subtitled The Conspiracy to Murder Nicole Brown Simpson. That book was published in soft cover by Rainbow Books and copyrighted 1996. We've also been visiting with Stephen Singular, the author of Legacy of Deception, published in softcover by Dove Books and copyrighted 1995, as well as Donald Freed, along with Raymond Briggs, the co-author of Killing Time, that published in hardcover by Macmillan and also copyrighted 1996. All three authors, obviously, have developed information indicating that O.J. Simpson did not commit the crimes that he is popularly supposed to have committed. There are other interviews, not as a sequential series, but rather as separate standalone entities that will, taken together, provide an incremental understanding or a greater incremental understanding of the facts concerning the O.J. Simpson case. Those other two interviews were conducted back-to-back -back on, no on November 24th of 1996. All of the half-hour segments that I've been producing for about the last year and a half or so since uh, the early summer of 1995, as well as the interviews that I've done and the weekly One Step Beyond shows that I do, are available from a tape duplication service. The name of that tape duplication service is Spitfire, that's S P I T. F-I-R-E, one word. Their mailing address is P.O. Box 1179, 
P.O. Box 1179. That is in Ben Loman, California. That's capital B-E-N, capital L-O-M-O-N-D. The zip code is 95005. There's also an email address, A-L-C-A-L-A-M-E. That's A-L-C-A-L-A-M-E at ix.netcom.com. The address, once again, the mailing address for Spitfire, S-P-I-T-F-I-R-E, one word, P.O. Box 1179, Ben Lomond, California, capital B-E-N, capital L-O-M-O-N-D, zip code 95005. The email address is A-L-C-A-L-A-M-E, one word, that's A-L-C-A-L-A-M-E, at ix.netcom.com. And again, neither myself nor the station gets money out of this arrangement. I'm in the process of setting up a new service to distribute the long archive shows. Those are the long radio documentaries consisting of printed information read at length into the record. Those will be available at some point in the not-too-distant future from a new tape duplication service. In the meantime, people can uh, either write to a publication that I'm in the process of starting. I can't give you any details about it because this is something I'll be getting money out of. The name of that publication is Other Means. Uh, the title is taken from the famous quote from Prussian military theoretician Karl von Clausewitz that war is the continuation of politics by other means. You can uh, write to Other Means at P.O. Box 1917-10. That's box 1917-10. That is in San Francisco, California, 94119-1710. You can write to them about information concerning the archive shows or, preferably, about uh, other means. A more direct way of uh, inquiring about the archive shows, which are temporarily available but not on a formal basis from a tape duplication service, is to write to me. And you can write to me care of, by the way, my last, my name is David, E-M-O-R-Y is the last name. You can write to me, care of, K-F-J-C-F-M, that's Kangaroo, Fred John Charles F-M. The address is 12345, that's 12345, El Monte Road, capital E-L, capital M-O-N-T-E Road, Los Altos Hills, California, capital L-O-S, capital A-L-T-O-S, Hills, California, 94022. Once again, you can write to me, Dave Emery, care of KFJCFM, 12345 El Monte Road, Los Altos Hills, California, 94022. There's also an email address that you can write to to inquire about uh, archive shows or perhaps other means as well. D E M O R Y, one word, D E M O R Y at well.com. That email address again, D-E-M-O-R-Y, at well.com. That concludes this half-hour segment. My name is Dave Emery. Thanks for listening. Hello, my name is Dave Emery, and it's my uh, privilege to be presenting three authors who will be pro pro basically providing us with a different perspective on the O.J. Simpson case. First of all, we have Stephen Wirth, along with Carl Jaspers, the author of Blood Oath, subtitled The Conspiracy to Murder Nicole Brown Simpson. We also have Stephen Singular, the author of Legacy of Deception. Oh, by the way, uh, Blood Oath was published in softcover by Rainbow Books, copyrighted 1996. Again, we have Stephen Singer, the author of, among other titles, Legacy of Deception about the O.J. Simpson case, published in softcover by Dove and copyrighted 1995. And we also have Donald Freed, the author of many titles, and along with Raymond Briggs, the co-author of Killing Time, subtitled The Full Investigation. Uh, gentlemen, welcome once again to our airwaves. Thanks, always a pleasure. Good evening. Uh, now, there, there are a couple of things that I wanted to uh, discuss about the O.J. Simpson case, so perhaps we can, I can... Uh, inject those at the end of the discussion, and uh, some of your observations concerning the uh, civil case can uh, start off. This will be sort of a free-form discussion. Uh, I wondered what your reactions were to uh, O.J. Simpson's testimony on uh, this past Friday, and also to the media portrayal of that. Uh, uh, this is Steve Singer. I'd like to hear Donald talk about it. He's a lot closer to the action than I am, certainly, now. As from my understanding, he's spent some time with the bakers, and can you give us your <laughs> update? 
Yes. First of all, gentlemen, let me greet you um, on this week of uh, a media storm, a kind of a new scoundrel time, not seen for some years. But in this period, when the media seems to have gone off the rails, whether it be the hapless officer Jewel in Atlanta or the CIA, CIA Contra cocaine connection, which brought the director of central intelligence to no other place on earth but Watts, California, uh, to face an angry crowd, uh, or to Santa Monica, California, where there is a kind of lynching in the air. Uh, and I was in Santa Monica, and I was speaking on television, but I was observing. And I may say that the furore and the frenzy is such that no less than three columnists in the Los Angeles Times took note of what Howard Rosenberg, the media critic, called a second rush to judgment. Howard Rosenberg, Bill Boyarsky, and uh, Peter T. King uh, all set out on uh, Saturday and Sunday in their columns to strike a cautionary note about the kind of minute-by-minute -minute tracking that was going on by MSNBC and other uh, media conglomerates. Uh, tents and technicians uh, dotted the landscape. A crowd was forming. Uh, black clouds uh, moved overhead. Uh, rain uh, fell intermittently. Uh, Klieg lights fizzed and smoked in the rain. It was an eerie, unnatural, uh, and almost uh, surreal scene. Uh, there were shouts, there were jeers, there were cheers. Vincent Buliosi was driven from the Greensward into a trailer by a part of an angry mob. It was Americana, such as not seen in a long time, while uh, relays of reporters and lawyers from all over the country uh, scuffled in and out from the audio room where the press uh, listens to the trial, um, the overflow uh, from the handful of seats available uh, within the courtroom uh, to accommodate the world press and that uh, small number of local citizens, some of whom had been uh, waiting since 4 a.m., in the morning, in the rain, uh, to get into the uh, what is now becoming a kind of killing zone. And lawyers would rush, saying, Simpson's in trouble. He's in trouble. Uh, he clenched his fist. He swallowed. He breathed heavily. He sat back in his chair. And each element uh, of the syntax of body language, of rhetoric, of answers was treated like a bullfight or a boxing match, except that you only heard uh, the blows that were landed against Simpson. Uh, it was uh, a, a scene of such terror and pity that eventually a young woman on court TV uh, exclaimed that uh, he seemed, Simpson seemed vulnerable. He was at bay. Uh, not that he was confused and not that anyone had forced him to lose his demeanor whatsoever. Uh, but nevertheless, the intensity was such. Uh, it seemed to be symbolized by the Goldman's uh, father and daughter who leaned over the rail, staring in implacable vengeance uh, at Simpson. A and so it went uh, throughout the day with more promised for next week. Uh, something that would have been familiar in the 1920s or the 1930s, not since the Lindbergh trial, uh, has there been such atavism uh, and such savagery? And uh, so it went with the assumption never identified that each increment of reportage was based on the assumption that Simpson was guilty, that he'd gotten away with murder, that he'd been pardoned by a jury too black and too stupid, or both, 
uh, to take uh, accountability or responsibility for justice in the criminal case, and that now it was a time for vengeance. Now it would be payback time the other way. Now Geraldo Rivera and the chorus of disapproval, the packs of the media, their day in court had come. This was no longer about Simpson, but it was about uh, the media which and the pundits and the professors and the experts who had been humiliated by predicting the wrong outcome in the criminal case. Uh, and there it was. And as a historian, and I'll end on this note, I said on um, MSNBC, uh, though much of it was cut for the East Coast, I have to tell you, I said, this is November 22nd, 1996, right. a day that should remind us that it is quite possible for a human being to be turned into a monster. This is 1965 in terms of the Kennedy assassination, and Lee Harvey Oswald has yet to be vindicated by history. And I said that just as Officer Jewell in Atlanta was forced to fit the psychological profile until his timeline saved him and returned his mother's Tupperware to her, so O.J. Simpson was now forced into the psychological profile of the battering, beating husband who must become uh, the murderer. And I said to Mr. Gibson, uh, I see that you turn pale when I dare to suggest that perhaps, after all, Simpson doesn't fit that profile any more than Richard Jewell fit the Mad Bomber profile. And that was about the end of my time. And I give you that now for your reaction. Uh, Donald, before uh, we get the reactions from the two Stevens, I wanted to read uh, into the record uh, a short section of Stephen Worth, uh, Worth's book, Blood Oath, because I think it uh, is in opposition to what you just said. We'll set, uh, shed a little bit of light and also some Good. foundation for further discussion. In Chapter 5 of Blood Oath uh, by Stephen Worth and Carl Jaspers, uh, we, uh, in Skinner's story, the plan, Skinner, the code name uh, for the informant who uh, spurred this book, and this uh, and gentleman, maintained, this individual maintains that he was... Uh, part of the actual strike team that killed Nicole and Ron, uh, a part of a white supremacist uh, underground group called Cause, Christian Aryan Underground Special Enforcers. Uh, in Chapter 5, we read, The plan for the anniversary celebration, that of the murder of Alan Berg, uh, written about uh, so effectively by Stephen Singular, the plan for the anniversary celebration consisted of a plot so sinister, so creative, so diabolical, that the outcome would provide for the embarrassment of an entire city an entire race, and an entire nation. The plot included a well-thought-out action that would damage the U.S. judicial system forever. It would create a sense of doubt that would exist in every future trial. When we had all gathered in the farmhouse's spacious parlor, the Discoverer, that's one of the, the code name for another member of the team, the Discoverer continued to explain the rationale of the plan. Quote, Evidence presented and testimony offered by law enforcement officers will be challenged forever from this case forward, unquote, he said. Still quoting, it's a plan designed in part to be a payback for all those responsible for actions that had been carried out against freedom-loving white supremacists, unquote. Another founder of the cause picked up the explanation, quote, the plan is centered around an individual easily recognized and respected among both blacks and whites. It will look like he's being framed by the authorities. The situation's designed to call upon and challenge interpersonal beliefs that every person holds. People will choose sides. Their consciences won't permit otherwise. The final coup will occur when our target is found guilty or his credibility is destroyed. This event will generate instant racial tension followed by violence. We're going to ensure that by fueling what will already be an inflamed situation. The plan will use the distrust between the authorities and the blacks that's existed in Los Angeles for years. At first, everyone will choose up sides. As the discussions become heated and clouded with rhetoric, violence will follow. After much destruction has occurred, the cause will then step forward to take credit for the framing. But it will be painfully obvious that we couldn't have done it without the help of an easily duped, overzealous, prosecution. Uh, that, by the way, uh, by way of not only uh, serving in opposition to your uh, very eloquent remarks, Donald, but to also to perhaps set the stage for uh, some of the uh, future discussion. Uh, the two Stevens, what reactions do you have to, uh, to uh, what took place on Friday and to what Donald had to say? Well, 
Uh, this is uh, Stephen Worth, and uh, what I'd like to add is basically what's been coming out of this trial, and unfortunately because Judge Fujisaki decided not to televise it, you're getting sound bites from the media. Nobody has made mention of the 23 unidentifiable mm -hmm. footprints mm -hmm. that Bosiak has talked about. Mm -hmm. It's got, kind of got lost. Nobody's talked about the cut on the right thumb of the right hand, on, you know, on the glove. That's the right-hand glove. Stephen Worth, what are these 23 footprints? Because I haven't seen any coverage of those in the media. Well, it's, it happens to be reported uh, uh, out of the trial. Now, I'm waiting. I've downloaded as much as I can as it comes down onto the Internet and, and been reading the testimony. Uh, the, there is a cut on the right-hand glove. Of, uh, in, fact, that, uh, in fact, that came out of the um, testimony of the glove specialist, Reuben, who they had the glove, he had the glove in his hand because everybody would always kind of dodge around it. I don't remember whether it was a cut or not a cut. They said, would you examine it? And there's a cut on near the right thumb. Very difficult for a right-handed person to cut your right thumb. Then on the back of it, which is even more uh, unusual, you've got cut marks on the raised blading. Now, again, that suggests that the right hand was across the front of somebody, and somebody with a knife in their left hand uh, did it. So, um, but you haven't heard anything about that. I mean, that you know, you you would think that that would be instant reporting because there's something you know uh, uh, newsworthy, it, because that's brand new information never appeared uh, out there. But what's to me even more distressing, and more to following what blood oath is about, because it's more than just about the O.J. Simpson case. You were the first to inform me that you had heard through somebody who I checked with and verified today that Metzger, the same guy who is in our book, the same guy that was supposedly linked to the attempted bombing and burning of the first AME church, is oh, now I recommending imagine. to his people, to other people. As a matter of fact, he'll autograph my book, anybody who orders it. He's recommended two books, my book and the one by Carl Rowan, The Coming Race War in America. Carl Rowan, a nationally syndicated columnist, by the way. That's right. And, you know, the Carl Rowan's book talks about Turner Diaries and a lot of, uh, of these militia groups. And he's also, by the way, Carl Rowan is also black. That's right. Apparently, I think this starts to support what the information was provided to us. Uh, and as I've said many times, all of the information that we received via Skinner, all right, we believe there's a good deal of it. It's kind of like an enigma. Uh, it has different meanings. I mean, the blood planting, the way they said it, could have come through since they talk about Colby being the provider, and Colby could stand for three things. The person that we've isolated as a fellow by Colburn, a DNA specialist, Colby, who was in, out of the CIA, which is the next door, was the next door neighbor on Gretna Green of um, Nicole, or Colby, which is the uh, location of the LAPD uh, headquarters where Mark Furman came out of. Uh, Stephen, we should note for uh, legal purposes that Tom Metzger denies any involvement in the uh uh, attempt on the a first AME church, although he does admit uh, being in touch, touch with the Fourth Reich skinheads. Go ahead. Right. Well, it's, uh, what I'm going by is what's in newspaper articles right. that talked about him. Now, well, there's no definite link. I'm just real curious to why he's now recommending uh, my book. I mean, it doesn't make much sense other <laughs> than they like publicity. Well, and that's written about in Turner Diaries also. It's also written about in the passage from your book that I just read. They said, one of the questions I've always had about your book is whether perhaps uh, this may have been exactly what uh, cause is described as, as going to do. In other words, at a certain point, getting the word out, although I also hold open the possibility that uh, it's exactly also what, what Skinner said. I mean, I, I cannot make a definite decision, but I wonder. Well, it's 
Uh, you know, I'd like to hear uh, from uh, Stephen Singler what uh, his take on what he's heard about the trial uh, and uh, his take on you know, what Donald has said and what I've said. Well, two things. Uh, first of all, as I've watched this, and I, I, it has occurred to me that we're, I think we've moved into an arena where we're analyzing an event that never happened. Uh, at least, of course, two people were killed here, and I don't mean to make light of that. But I'm just am having great difficulty getting past that. I mean, when I watch the level of analysis, the amount of time and energy and media that is devoted to this, that's what I am, from my own personal opinion, that's what I believe. I believe that people are essentially analyzing an event that never took place, which throws this into a whole other category which perhaps Donald and uh, David are better equipped to analyze than I am. Number two, at the risk of being exceedingly politically incorrect, I don't think we have any concept of what went on between Nicole Simpson and, and O.J. Simpson. And if, if some people may see this male-female thing as black and white, but I'm not one of them. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what went on between these two people. I don't know who hit whom or when or where. But I am willing to believe, I'm, I do definitely, profoundly believe that it is not the black and white situation that people have made it out to be. And that's not an excuse for domestic violence or anything else. We simply don't know what happened. We have facts and absolutely no truth. And those are the two things that have been on my mind lately. I don't know how the rest of you feel about them. Stephen Singler, you noted in Legacy of Deception the... Imp seemingly impenetrable, this is something perhaps we can come back to later, uh, the impenetrable media, impenetrable media wall surrounding this case. You, you were not only uh, actually part of the case in the sense that your book proposal actually became part of the, the criminal case, but uh, also you attempted to go to various media sources. You have, were contacted by an anonymous informant within the L.A. legal system right. uh, because of your work on the Allenberg murder, which Stephen Worth's anonymous informant says I... was the the, uh, the anniversary celebration. That was one of the motivations for this. Right. Uh, it's astounding to me to uh, see the way the media is covering it. The San Francisco Chronicle uh, of Saturday, November 9th of 1996 carried... Some information uh, about Werner Spitz, who was testifying uh, concerning right. the forensics for the plaintiffs. Werner Spitz, by the way, was also involved with the House Select Committee on Assassinations, uh, forensic evaluation of the Kennedy assassination, as was Michael Bodden. Perhaps we should remember in that regard the intelligence community has an old saying that, uh, give us the coroner, we'll control the city. So one of the things I found so remarkable is that... Uh, Basically, Spitz, as reported in, among other papers, the Chronicle of 9, 9, or 11 9 96, uh, was saying that uh, the wounds on O.J. Simpson's hands were made by Nicole's fingernails. Yet, uh, as I recall, the analysis of the tissue and blood under Nicole's fingernails indicated it wasn't O.J.'s. Right. That's correct. Well, there was blood that was not O.J.'s. There were, in addition to those 23 footprints, there were also 17 sets of fingerprints at the crime scene that were never identified either. But the point is that the blood, that, that the, uh, the material yeah. under Nicole's fingernails did not come from O.J. Simpson. That's correct. Well, well I'll tell you what's of interest. As we you know, kind of look at um, what's coming out of the civil, I've, I've read nine days of O.J. Simpson's civil uh, testimony. Uh, it's actually his deposition. And, you know, the Bruno Maglis is one of the things that I think Geraldo and the media played to the hill. What, and they said, well, now we've got him because we've got pictures showing him wearing Bruno Maglis. And he said he would never own them. Except that's not what he said. He said he would never own those ugly-ass shoes shown in the criminal case. And he wouldn't. They were, and he says that they were purplish-green at the end of it. When they kept asking him again, they said, as of 1994, did you ever own a pair of, uh, or do you know if you ever owned a pair of Bruno Maglis? And he said no, which clearly says he didn't know whether he owned them, whether he knew it or not. So it's, it, it's not like a cut and dry thing. What bothers me the most about some of the things, because it's like an electronic lynching that's going on. It is, Stephen. Remember that this is also an electronic uh, proof, uh, truth saying uh, situation. We have to uh, watch our choice of words. Yeah. Well, I, it, it, it's been uh, publicized enough that that's what OJ said. I've seen it on the, the electronic media elsewhere, but we just have to, to keep that in mind. Please proceed. Okay. Um, one of the things is you've got an FBI agent 
paid by the federal government, uh, testifying in a civil case. Right. It's almost unheard of. Right. Uh, in order for a, uh, an FBI agent to testify, he's got to get approval almost up to the director. The case also, and by the way, I'm getting the feeling that the uh, Baker and Blazer, et cetera, are setting this up for an appeal based on its, you know, they said that, you, you know, you can't have double jeopardy. But this is like the state retrying its case through the civil case because it's funded in part by taxpayers' funds. The same witnesses are appearing who, if, you know, if you'll notice in, during the case, they keep out, did you get paid? Uh, did you send a bill in? And there hasn't been a bill that I know of yet that's been sent in to pay for these people who are on salary with the city of L.A. or the state of California. That's highly unusual. I mean, if you tried a case and said, I'd like the FBI to testify yes. for you, yes. they won't even talk to you. Yes. Uh, Stephen Worth, something that you and uh, Donald Freed both point out is that uh, both Nicole and O.J., we're getting both written and telephone death threats from white supremacist groups. Some of these were apparently delivered, uh, according to your uh, sources, by sympathetic, uh, basically sympathetic to the cause group, LAPD <clears throat> people. And uh, the, in the book about Kato Kalin, it's mentioned that the FBI was aware of this and told OJ. And yet we have heard nothing about this. And in fact, uh, Nicole, as you revealed, Donald Freed, w re believed she was under surveillance and actually asked O.J. she was scared because of the threats and uh, her perception that she was under surveillance, which dovetails with what Stephen Worth uh, was told by Skinner, uh, and that basically uh, she wanted O.J. to come around. Yeah, we've heard none of this in any of the media discussion that I've seen. Well, remember, and this picks up where uh, Stephen Singular left off, that you're listening to the plaintiff's case, and you're hearing a bill of attainder uh, against O.J. Simpson. And remember, at exa exactly this time, before her death, Nicole Simpson was very unwell, and uh, Mr. Simpson was bringing her soup and food and helping to care for her. What we have here is a three-dimensional relationship, as Stephen suggests. And let me uh, get behind the dramatic scene in court, where the lights were lowered, and O.J. Simpson sat in the witness chair in shadows, while behind him and over him loomed a very large photograph of Nicole Simpson, uh, bruised and abraded, um, taken sometime after the New Year's Eve confrontation of 1989. And the questions, did you ever hit her? Did you strike her? Did you kick her? Did you strangle her? Never, 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 never. That was broadcast around the world to the predictable reaction of, he must have done it. They have proof. There's the photograph. This is complete denial. This is lying of a magnitude that must include murder. Now, let me put it to you logically, gentlemen, and to your listeners. If you have an open mind, never mind a presumption of innocence or any sympathy for O.J. Simpson, but simply the uh, dignity and self-respect uh, of an open mind, let me tell you what those pictures show. Remember, there's only one set of pictures. There's only one credible incident of physical contact to which O.J. Simpson pled no contest, that is to say, guilty, and took responsibility. And that is New Year's Eve, 1989. Now, what that photograph shows, and the defense may indeed boldly decide to use that photograph uh, for Simpson rather than against him. And here's how that would work. The photograph shows scratches, bruises, abrasions, uh, redness, uh, and some discoloration. And that is consistent with Simpson's statement that they wrestled, he had her in an arm lock, he, <coughs> he held her, he had to push her, he locked her out of the room, all of this as a result of uh, a mutual physical let us put it neutrally, a physical uh, confrontation. He said again and again and again, Friday in court, I take responsibility. I don't know how all the uh, bruises may have occurred after I locked her out. She may have fallen, but it doesn't matter. I take responsibility. He said that over and over and over again. And only if you play that against the statements of never, never, never. 
Now, can you, does, does the testimony make sense? Uh, let me conclude in this way. Let me tell you what the photograph does not show. The photograph does not show that O.J. Simpson hit Nicole Simpson. Because if O.J. Simpson had ever hit Nicole Simpson, if any heavyweight athlete, and in this case one of the great world-class athletes of coordination and power and speed, uh, who, the, no, who doesn't have to run anywhere to hit someone, if he's standing next to a smaller, however fierce physically and well-trained Miss Simpson may have been, she was considerably smaller and slighter. And if she was standing within range of O.J. Simpson's arm and fist, you would not be looking at a young woman with scratches and uh, bruises. You would be looking at a smashed face. Uh, one, one point we should make, Donald, because uh, O.J. Simpson's athletic prowess has come into the arguments that he could have done it because he was such a great athlete. Uh, he certainly is still very, very strong, but he's no longer the uh, the running back he once was. He's, he's very arthritic as it came out in the... Uh, yes, the and that, that applies to... That's the killing time itself. I'm now talking about 1989. And had he hit her, you would see broken bones. Mm -hmm. You would see wires. You would see prolonged hospitalization. You know, uh, Donald, uh, just, there's just another... Stephen any... Worth, Stephen Worth, I want to take... Uh... Hello, my name is Dave Ermey, and once again, we are going to continue with our conversation with Stephen Worth, along with Carl Jaspers, uh, the author of Blood Oath, Stephen Singular, the author of Legacy of Deception, and Donald Freed, along with Raymond Briggs, the author of Killing Time, all presenting information about the O.J. Simpson case that is at variance with what the public has been told. Stephen Worth, you, uh, when we left off, you had a comment that you wanted to uh, interject. Yes. Uh, in O.J. Simpson's civil deposition, one of the, uh, as part of it, uh, the photograph came up. And I don't know if that's the exact photograph, because all you can do is read uh, testimony in a deposition. But there's a claim being made in, in the deposition by O.J. Simpson that the photograph that he was shown in the depot was a photograph uh, with makeup yes, on. Yes, that's true. It's, that's another photograph. Is that another photograph? That's another one, but there is only one. That there's only one incident. The assertion that there will be all sorts of witnesses and experts that will chart the course from wife abuse to murder. Don't forget, no one testified in the criminal case. Not one. And the experts in this case who never interviewed O.J. Simpson for one minute, of course, are not being allowed to testify. And as to the various other so-called eyewitnesses who were not credible enough for the prosecution in the criminal case, we will see if they are uh, brought forward. But remember, the defense had and still has the authority on the world stage of this sort of abuse, and that's Dr. Lenore Walker. And she interviewed Simpson at great length. And she came away with a statement that he did not fit the pattern. There was not the momentum. He did not fit the profile. Well, it's and interesting also in that surreptitious tape of the 93-911 call, uh, uh, Nicole blurts out that he had not hit her in four years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's nothing in between that 89 and 93 incident uh, on you know, based on that, it's going to be very interesting when they start to match up what's claimed in Nicole's diary and what she states there, and other incidents which they may not be able to uh, you know uh, corroborate as far as what she's stating. Because I understand there were two other things about where she claims that O.J. didn't have the kids and O.J. was uh, at the Brown family at the time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's interesting. But one other thing that's come up, and nobody is, I guess they haven't been caught it, and it deals with uh, uh, Donald Freed's um, The Killing Time, in the Bronco, Detective Edwards, when he was on the stand, they asked him about, and he just answered each time, because I guess he thought it, it meant, didn't mean anything, whether or not, this goes back to the 85 incident, not the no the effect the eighty nine incident, and he said, could you hear, was it quiet? And he said extremely quiet. Mm. Could you hear the and this was O J driving away. Could you hear the vehicle? And that was a Bentley. Even 
kind of a quiet vehicle. Mm. And he said, yes, you could even hear it shifting. Really? It's changing in speed. So that's going to set up perfectly for a scenario if someone says, why didn't Allen Park hear that vehicle? And, and you know that Allen Park was asked, uh, just as uh, Stephen Wirth has brought up, that the FBI on the stand last week revealed that there were 23 partial prints never tested and uh, never analyzed. Uh, in that regard, Donald, let me interrupt ever so briefly. I wanted to interject at exactly this point. Uh, and, and perhaps as you continue, you could uh, incorporate this and, and other, uh, you know, the, the two Stevens can incorporate this into their comments. San Francisco Examiner of Tuesday, November 5th of 1996, has an article by Laura McCoy, M-E-C-O-I, of the Scripps McClatchy News Service, State Line, Santa Monica, headlined, O.J. Defense Suggests Dog Carried Evidence. And uh, what I want to read is the way uh, Judge Fujisaki is hearing this particular case. Fuji's skipping down, we read, Fujisaki continued Monday to block defense questions about evidence seen but not collected, and he refused to let the defense float most of its alternate theories about the killings. For in Fujisaki, for instance, blocked defense efforts to press Fung about his failure to collect a piece of triangular paper police photographs show between the murder victims' bodies. The defense argued at the first trial that an imprint on the piece of paper could have been the shoe print of a second killer. The judge also blocked extensive questioning about the lengthy delay in spotting a blood stain on a pair of socks found on Simpson's floor. Two other on uh, Simpson's bedroom floor. Two other articles, very quickly, with regard to uh, not only the that that particular aspect of Fujisaki's conduct, but the jury selection. That, uh, by the way, the San Francisco Examiner of once again November fifth of nineteen ninety six. Uh, the San Francisco Examiner of Monday, October 14th of this year, Simpson jury pool is weighted toward, quote, probably guilty, unquote. Subheaded judge tended to exclude blacks who think he's innocent. Only 6% in the group believe that's likely. This is by Michael Fleeman, F-L-E-E-E-F-L-W-E-M-A-N of the Associated Press, State Line, Santa Monica. That again, San Francisco Examiner 101496 and the San Jose Mercury News of 92596. Also AP, also out of Santa Monica. Simpson judge pushes jury selection. Biased or not, potential panelists are joining the pool. And this, this knocked me out of my seat when I read it. Among those admitted to the jury, uh, jury pool by the increasingly impatient judge was a white female correspondent for Time magazine who joined the chorus of potential jurors inclined to believe Simpson guilty. There's an old rhythm and blues novelty song called Framed uh, from the 1950s in which uh, one of the lines uh, says basically... The judge took out a bottle of whiskey, poured it over my head, and said to the jury, convict this man, he's drunk. You know, and it's all about a guy singing about how he was framed. And this, this reminds me a little bit of that, that, uh, that novelty song, only in a much grimmer way. That, uh, gentlemen, your, your reactions to some of this, because this, again, in the context of evidence that uh, was not collected, and apparently Fujisaki will, will not allow this to be discussed. Stephen Singer, you wrote about how Judge Ito dealt the defense setback after setback after setback. Yeah, this this guy apparently just wants to out Ito Ito. I, uh, from what I can tell, I I was very curious in pursuing Donald a little bit here, if I might, though, just as, because as I said earlier, he is he is quite close to the action. If he can tell us anything at all about what the defense may be doing or may be planning, I realize that might be confidential information. But you, is it true, Donald, that you have spoken to the Bakers some recently? Uh, well, you know, when the plaintiffs accepted the so-called independent timeline, so right. that now both sides accept the same timeline, uh, it was clear to the defense uh, that the end game or the climax of this trial would come in those last four minutes or so at Rockingham. And indeed, last week, Robert Baker uh, asked uh, the uh, honest limousine driver, Alan Park, did you see or hear? Uh, O.J. Simpson drive up, and he said no. Now, you know they have twice asked to take the jury up to Rockingham right. so that jurors could stand there in the silent darkness and see or not see, just uh, as Alan Park had. And they've been refused, and they are going to try again uh, because Alan Park is their alibi witness, unwitting and, um, is, uh, and circumstantial, though his testimony may be. He is their alibi witness, and they have now, uh, it has reached a state where last week I heard on Burden of Proof and on Geraldo, uh, two different lawyers, one of the Melanie Lomax, say, uh, the timeline doesn't matter. Right. 
I, I heard that. Yeah, that, that was said in essence. The timeline doesn't matter, whereas others have said Alan Park provides the timeline to convict O.J. Simpson. Right. So you have the most bizarre uh, yeah. uh, non sequiturs going out as news. That's like that's uh, like Spitz uh, claiming that the wounds on O.J. were made by Nicole's fingernails, but the, the tests indicate that stuff wasn't from O.J. Right. right. What and this all took place in a minute and 15 seconds. I'll well, tell you what's find most disturbing you about that. And, I, and by the way, I've been, uh, the footprint on the post that uh, yes. the defense brought in yes. was because I'd, I had sent blow-ups. Uh, I'd blown up photos to Blazer. In fact, I've been constantly forwarding information to them. You deserve yeah. great credit because that was as big a piece of news uh, until the 23 footprints came along. That's right. Now, one of the things, in fact, I've got it on a website and, you know, pictures. Uh, Nicole Brown Simpson, in all of the uh, descriptions, including American Tragedy, talks about her being having a throat slice and crumpling to the ground. The problem with that is her feet are jammed underneath a, stench, a stationary lower post mm. with um, scrapes and blood seeping through the scrapes on her legs on the other side and a totally swollen ankle. Now, ankles don't swell after death, which meant she had to be in that position for a while. Uh, she couldn't move. She couldn't fall that way because it jammed under there. Mm -hmm. It's not just flat. There's also rotational marks on that leg. Now, there's no way somebody can fall. But bothers me is Golden, Lakshmanan, nobody has written that up in the autopsy mm -hmm. reports. Mm -hmm. Yet there is a close-up photo of her ankle over the menu. That photo shows that ankle totally swollen to the point where you could tough to even see her toes. Yet there's no mention of it. You couldn't do that and fall within that time limit that they're talking about. Stephen Singler, you had uh, a comment about what uh, Donald Freed said earlier. Well, yeah, this is a little bit different from that. But to go back to your original question about Fu Fujisaki, why can Mark Furman not be brought into this trial? Mm -hmm. Why can't... Why wouldn't the defense call him and just grill him for the first time ever. Well, that's right. Well, you what? see, the judge has this latitude, he thinks, uh, and he's stating that the LAPD are not on trial. Well, of course, this is doing real violence here to the system. And well, Benadder could... testified. Yes. He? Well, he did because the plaintiffs brought him in. There's an interesting thing uh, on the subject of Mark Furman. I'd like to interject a couple things at this point. Uh, just reading now from the San Jose Mercury of Wednesday, January 17th of 1996, also AP out of L.A. This was after the, uh, this, this concerned uh, the criminal trial. Furman was the trial, jurors write, and skipping down, Furman was the trial, Bess wrote. Uh, this is Carrie Bess, one of the jurors. Furman found the hat, Furman found the glove, Furman found the blood, Furman went over the gate, Furman did everything. When you throw it out, what case do you have? You've got reasonable doubt right before you even get to the criminalist. And then, Donald, in your book, you've written uh, concerning uh, Mark Furman and some of his past operations uh, or some of his past conduct. Could a Los Angeles-based jury be predisposed to believe that police might perjure themselves or falsify or plant evidence? The Simpson trial did not exist in a vacuum. The Rodney King incident had occurred only a few years before in 1991. In fact, Furman had been one of the 45 police officers identified in the Christopher Commission report the city's response to the Rodney King beatings. That's true. It, it has been a uh, kind of arbitrary, in the extreme set of rulings uh, by Judge Fujisaki. Yeah, and um, even uh, some commentators have asked, what will history say if a victory here uh, in the short term is based on the defense having its hands tied. Right. How will this do any honor or mean anything approaching justice? Right. Has yeah. anybody gotten a hold of the actual um, uh, trial? Not, I wouldn't. Well, it would have been a trial of Mark Furman um, with the state. What was contained within that? Because in speaking to somebody from 
the uh, criminal investigation department. They apparently said that part of the reason that, uh, you know, he pled uh, no contest was there was more behind that mm. than just that single thing of, uh, you know, I never used the N-word. Mm -hmm. Well, indeed, well, your book, Stephen, after all, cites the March 9th, 1995 direct examination of Detective Furman by Marsha Clark, wherein he perjures himself as to his whereabouts on the night of the murder. Yeah, there's, you know, there's been a lot of talk about Mark Furman, which, you know, uh, if, unless you can bring him up on the stand, then you can't ask him. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, how much uh, involvement, how well did he know Nicole? Uh, you know, by the way, there's a picture, I, I, and I, one of the things I'm trying to do is get a hold of the color photos. There's a picture showing the hat, which, that's another thing, by the way, uh, the judge finally allowed in that the hat and the glove uh, may have been planted. And that's a surprise. Mm -hmm. He let that in with Lang, because that hat has absolutely no blood on it, mm -hmm. yet it's under a leafy plant that's covered with blood. And it's also, the, the, that glove at Bundy was never sent out for DNA testing. Yes. We mentioned this, by the way, in one of our previous interviews, uh, Stephen. I'd, I'd like to, uh, if at all possible, and this is not to, in any way to, to negate the importance of what you're saying, but to get to some of the things that we have not had a chance to talk about. Stephen Singular, you had a uh, comment that you were about to make. No, it was just a, a bit of a follow-up on, on the absence of Furman from the trial. I, I just I don't understand that at all. Mm -hmm. it, it seems to me that his defense could call him as a witness. If he's hostile, he's hostile. But they could ask the, the questions that now seem on the table for people who really studied the evidence. And uh, without that, I mean, the whole thing just seems a bit hollow to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If, if O.J. Simpson can be grilled, he can, he can certainly be grilled. Uh, and... Uh, it's, yeah. in, it's interesting that both uh, your anonymous source from within the legal system, Stephen Singular, and also your anonymous source who maintains he was part of the strike team, had uh, talked about basically uh, Nazi elements or white supremacist elements infiltrating LAPD, which is something that has been fairly well documented. Uh, one thing that uh, one of the many things Ito would not allow in the trial was information from LAPD personnel files or allegations by fellow officers that he was uh, the head of a group called WASP, White Anglo-Saxon Policemen. You know, you know, going to something that's new, and by the way, I've just faxed, you know, to Baker the same thing for him to check. If O.J. Simpson went to um, McDonald's to get a hamburger and came back, and Cato says he never saw him go back in the house, nobody has asked whether or not Cato Cato remembers whether O.J. Simpson set the alarm before he left to go for the hamburger. Because that raises a very interesting question. Alan Park sees um, O.J. Simpson go into the house around 1054.12, something like that. Well, in order to get into the house, if he had not been in there before, he would have had to 